you for doing this for us. Um, please describe your station rotation procedures and expectations and what uh, With the station procedures, we set it up where the students practiced the how to rotate and how to take the ownership of student-led transitions as well, which actually it allows them to take that leadership and that ownership, help each other when they're struggling in the centers. With word work, we really focused on the words that they're choosing and some of the different strategies to identify the meanings of the words and writing the words, spelling, all of those things. With writing, our focus is right now more on using text evidence to help with the writing. With the read to self, that's more of just practice with the reading skill at a right fit book. Um, word work, we just talked about. And um, read to someone is more focused on partner reading, but with skills. So reading past short paragraphs and talking through the skills or reading a sentence and identifying what does the word mean. That kind of thing. Um, the flexible seating, I actually got idea, the idea from Mrs. Maxwell, another third grade teacher here. Uh, who is very helpful and instrumental in setting it up, but it allows that flexibility of where the students are very rarely in an assigned seat. It just made more sense to transition to the flexible seating and to this where they can go and get started and not have one place they need to be. It allows that more community of learners. At the beginning of the year, okay. we started with just introducing one round of the Daily Five and we practiced what does it look like properly, what does it look like improperly. They had a lot of fun with showing ways that you're not supposed to behave, but it also was very meaningful because it showed things that you actually do see. They would do it exaggerated, but it is helpful to see those things and how to do it appropriately. And we actually have a stamina champion program where we I look for a student who's on task the entire time and able to be the stamp showing us that they're building their stamina and they are the stamina champion and they're able to climb up so they're, one of their goals is to work towards that. Um, and then slowly I would introduce a new round and we'd do it the same procedures, slowly introduce it um, using pretty much the daily five guide to introducing it with just modifications on what the centers looked like and what the rotation looked like. Mm -hmm. And how did they take to it? What they, was the student response? They really enjoyed it because it gave them a lot more flexibility. They took that ownership of learning. They were able to make the selections and make the learning meaningful for them and really feel like they had a say in what they were going to learn, how they were going to learn it. And especially with this particular group this year, I was pushed towards doing this more because they are a very active group. And this really helps with that. It, instead of bringing them down to an energy level of a traditional classroom, it brings the classroom up to their energy level, which allows them to really have that meaningful learning experience without constant recorrection and redirection during whole group. It takes that part out of the mix and it makes the time that I do spend with them in small groups that much more meaningful. What way, and you may have already touched on some of this, but in what ways does teaching this way uh, make you more effective and why? Like I said before, it really allows for that not as heavy focus on classroom management because the proceed when the procedures are set up, the rotations manage themselves, and it really helps with being able to focus more on the content and having the small group. Even though sometimes I'll be teaching the same concept to all four groups or a little bit different of a concept, I can really gear it towards what is their level, what is the way they learn. I have some groups that are much more visual learners, so doing comparing and contrasting, I'll have them compare and contrast pictures and then read about them. So that way it's really touching on the multiple modalities of their learning and it allows me to more, I feel more effectively reach them on their level as opposed to trying to bring them up to an expected level, but really meeting them where they need to be and help them. Can you, maybe you can illustrate with a particular student if you want to, or maybe a group you've been super focusing on, how have you seen their achievement, things you've been trying to work with them in growth? I mean, how have, where have you seen, just one example of a really significant growth because this has worked well yeah. for them. 
Although it's not ELA, I do the same procedures for math. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed was with we're currently teaching fractions, and my um, group one was having a very difficult time with fractions. And previously, when I was not doing math like this, they were the group that kind of needed a lot of reminders to stay on task during whole group and stuff. Mm -hmm. But now they're really a lot more their accountability is a lot higher, so I can see if they're actually getting it or if they're just kind of faking it. So it forces them to kind of step up, and it's shown because they've quickly grasped the concept of fractions, and it's been able to me check in on them a lot more in the small group setting than I was able to. Describe your uh, each station. You already uh, commented on the Daily Five as an organizing principle. Mm -hmm. Um, how long do they stay in the stations, and what components of the ELA block are done this way versus, you know, maybe you do other parts of ELA slightly differently? I'm not sure. So. Um, actually, I've officially transitioned over to my entire ELA block is this way. The way it currently runs is I meet with each group all five days a week for 20 minutes a session, and then we have five sessions, I have four groups, so that allows one 20 minute session in which I can use for the Dibbles progress monitoring assessments and things like that. But I know that's a big issue with a lot of people who are thinking about small groups is when do you find time. If you build a rotation around that, then you can. And I switch up the days, um, so I may do a reading skill on Monday writing on Tuesday, language on Wednesday, reading on Thursday, writing on Friday, and it allows to hit those, and even though you're not doing each one every day, the 20 minutes with just those five or six kids is really more meaningful than spending each day teaching each of them, because you can hit a lot closer on where they need to be, and you see a lot more progress in that setting. Thank you. Um, how often do you change out the activities, and in what way do you change them out? I usually change um, some of the activities, like the read to someone activities, weekly or bi-weekly, um, based on whatever skill we're doing. So this week we're working on compare and contrast, so the activities in those um, stations are very focused on compare and contrast, and in language we're working on context clues, so we have another one focused on context clues. Um, with the word work, I don't change the activities out as often, but I change the words, so they're still getting a difference. I change those weekly or sometimes more than one time a week. Like this week we had a shorter list at the beginning of the week, and they were able to get through it pretty quickly that we were able to... I changed them out today just to give them new words so they weren't... And when I see if they're getting bored or they're struggling with a certain thing, then I'll take it out of rotation and reevaluate how did I present it, what can I do to make it more meaningful for them. And normally I do, uh, we'll go over, if it's a new activity, we'll do a practice round all together so they can see it. And if it's a new word work, we'll talk about what the expectations of it are. And since we've been doing this for so long, it really works out high frequency lists and use those 300 and I base it on spelling tests that I give and other things that what are the words that they're having the most trouble in looking at their reading doing the formative assessments during small group seeing oh everybody's having trouble with this word I'm gonna put this word as a focus word just to kind of hit on that. Okay. So I think you've hit on some of these other questions um, you said how many groups do you see each day and for how long? Yep, I see uh, four groups for 20 minutes each every day. Okay. And then um, typical size? Uh, five to six. Five to six at each group. And what data do you use to form your groups? Uh, I use a variety of different things. Uh, Dibbles plays a part in it along with um, phonics screeners, the data from 95% group, the IU assessments and school net. Mm -hmm. Kind of a conglomerate of that, what they, their spelling tests, all kinds of things, and I'll change up the groups if I notice that one student's really strong in a skill, even though they may be a lower reading level, I'll put them into a different group because our focus is more on the skill than the reading part for that week, so I want them to, instead of going down to their reading level and not getting as much skill, go up to their skill and we can help um, scaffold and bridge that gap for the reading. 
so I think just always being flexible with the groupings. Okay, and laptops are designated for your classroom use, and how have you folded them into your rotation? We have six student laptops in the classroom. Uh, we have one laptop card for third grade, so as a third grade team, we decided to evenly split it, and we each got six laptops. Uh, each day they are able to use Imagine Learning and Big Brains both, and that way they can experience those programs and help them bridge, build those fluencies. And what are your feelings on the blended learning model? And in this case, we're asking, you've kind of elaborated on the small group and flexible seating, but with the technology component added in as well, what are your feelings and how has it been benefiting you? Or are you just kind of harnessing that right now? Oh, I'm a big advocate for blended learning. I'm actually a big advocate for things like flipped classrooms and things with the right amount of technology. Fortunately, that's not always possible, so you just adapt that to me. And I think the one thing I really like about blended learning is it's not a specific thing. It's a very user-driven definition, so whatever works for you as an educator and for your students is what blended learning is. But I think as long as the students are getting on the technology, using the programs Imagine Learning and Big Brains, and really being able to help foster their education with those programs, that when you're working with them in the small groups, or if you still do the whole group, you're able to use the skills that they're practicing there and just reinforce them in the groups. Mm -hmm. um. How have your students taken to Imagine Learning so far? How many weeks have you already used it? It's rather new, so mm -hmm. I know it's just the beginning. Of um, we've actually been using it since the first week back from break. Okay. Um, right away we got in using it, and they're able to go on 20 minutes every day and work on it. They've really seemed to enjoy it. They really like the rec reading to it and having it record their voice and just being able to see the same skills set in different ways. The scaffolding that's built within the program is an amazing thing to, so it helps them grow within that skill. At first it was a little confusing for them because they thought, oh I've already seen this, but we had a conversation about why they're seeing it multiple times and it made sense to them and they really take to that now and they really grasp onto it and enjoy it.